Okay, so um, first I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pleasure uh, to be here today uh, with you. So I was not totally uh, sure about the level of technicality that I should put in my talk. So there will be some images at the, at the beginning and then a bit of math. And uh, hopefully you will get something uh, out of it. So uh, let me mention that this is uh, the technical part is a joint work with Eric Moulin uh, from, uh, from Telecom uh, in Paris. Okay, so a bit of uh, scientific context. So you must have heard about the big data uh, in the last few years. And what has changed quite a bit in the last uh, 10 years is that um, technical progress has allowed to have very cheap uh, computation, very cheap storage, and very cheap like uh, sensors. So let me give you a few examples which I gathered from the web. So um, this is like uh, the Moore's law for, uh, for CPUs. So essentially, the power doubles uh, every like 18 months or, or two years. Although people predict like uh, that it should uh, slow down, it's still like going uh, uh, quite uh, quite up. So computation is uh, as uh, everything is is faster. Okay, so it should make our life easier. But the problem is that at the same time as that computers get uh, faster, people store more data. Okay, so this is the Moore's law for the cost of storage. So essentially for one gigabyte, so this is essentially like uh, one movie, 200 uh, pictures, like 20,000 emails. It was costing like $1 million in 1980, and now it's like a, a few cents. So clearly, uh, storage is not uh, uh, an issue uh, anymore. Another like t huge technical progress from the like uh, sensor side that most like scientific disciplines or companies can store because the cost of acquiring data has uh, significantly uh, been reduced. So this is like just DNA uh, sequencing. So to a, a full DNA, it costs like 100 million. I don't know how they compute this, but as the first, I guess the first genome was very expensive. But as years go by, uh, it's less and less expensive. And I guess if, if I was uh, to add the last figure, it should be uh, even less. Now people start to do like massive DNA sequencing, and I think the UK are going to sequence 10% of the population of something like this. So this is, um, this is now a lot cheaper. So now you have lots, uh, lots of data. But I think the, one of my main messages, although I've presented like everything getting bigger, is that the main change to me is not, uh, in big data, it's not the term big, but it's data. Okay, size is not the only thing that matters. The, new, the novelty is that most companies and most like scientific disciplines are starting to uh, do uh, business or science based on data. Sometimes it's big, sometimes uh, it's small, and I will show examples where it is big, very big, and some examples where it is not so big. Another key is the size and variety. Okay, you have a lot of different types of data. And in all my examples that I will show now, you will have like always two magic numbers, like this is uh, statistics you have n observations in dimension p. Okay, for example, it would be n images in dimension p, p being the number of pixels. Okay, so in all my examples, keep in mind, keep in mind that those numbers may be uh, quite big. Okay, so the first ex example where the money uh, comes from, this is like um, search engines. So whenever you type a query on Google, Bing, or Baidu, to be, uh, uh, then there's a lot going on behind the scene, and essentially there is like machine learning going on behind the scenes. And essentially, uh, now what is n? What is p? Okay, n will be the number of uh, clicks or clients of those search engines. So this can be like billions. And what is p? Like what is recorded for each client? This will be the entire search history, if not more. Uh, uh, so p can be like a list of all potential websites in the world. So this would be like billions, uh, billions or more. Where a one, when you put a one, where, where you have visited, visited that website and zero otherwise. So here, given that data, they are, they're going to order uh, the, res the, the results depending on your own like uh, preferences. So for me, Tour de France means Tour de France, but there's only one Tour de France, it's a cycling one. But uh, this is what, they, what, what, is, what is output uh, uh, for that. Okay, so there is machine learning. Whenever you type something onto Google or Bing, there is like large-scale machine learning going on. Then, like uh, marketing, so this is also a huge, uh, huge aspect of uh, one of the main applications right now of machine learning. 
where whenever you go on Amazon or any like uh, mer mer merchant, then you get uh, you get uh, proposed uh, proposed like uh, objects which are supposed to be tailored to your needs. So this is my web, this is my Amazon account, and they propose me like uh, uh, skirts. So there's still progress to be made. And this is why there's still research to be made to make this like uh, uh, better. So maybe I wear skirts, but uh, <laughs> this is my own private life. Okay. Okay, so let me like uh, away away from direct business is like other disciplines are heavily using like data. So this is one uh, closer to my interests, which is like computer vision. So the, the task of object recognition. So give me an image, tell me if there is something in it, uh, and tell me if there is a, a dog, a, a dog, a cat, or something, is immediately cast as a machine learning problem. Input you have like n images, and n is large. So now the current benchmarks are like millions of images, and if you're Google, you have billions of, uh, or Facebook, you have billions of such images, and each image is a big object. Why? Because you have millions, uh, millions of pixels for each, uh, for each image. A very, a very similar problem, uh, which looks very different, but at the end, for us, it's almost the same, it's uh, bioinformatics. So you replace, essentially, images by proteins, okay, so, and uh, uh, object classes by function of that protein. So we have a lot of proteins, I think more than two million different proteins for, for humans. Each protein is a complex object, okay? It's a sequence of amino acid, it is a 3D, it's a, it's a molecule in, a, in a three dimensions, and uh, uh, so the data is complex and high dimensional, and you have lots, lots of them. And the funny aspect is that many of the techniques developed for computer vision may be used for bioinformatics and vice versa. Uh, and so machine learning provides a good way to abstract uh, uh, the problems. And the last one, very big, and uh, so big that it's still not, it's still not like uh, open yet. So this is like uh, astronomy. So when you record like things from the space, from space, and they're currently building like this square kilometer uh, array, like which will be ready like in 10 years. And the output will be like 10 to the ninth gigabytes per, per day. So this is big data, okay? This is very big data. And the last one, which is not big data, and I removed it oh, from my slides, uh, this is uh, personal, personal pictures. Okay, so typically I have a slide which I forgot where I show my own personal pictures, organized like most of us in a flat folder. Okay, and it's, very, it's a very small problem. Okay, it fits in my hard drive, it fits in my cell phone, but it's quite complex because it's, um, it's hard to distinguish between uh, the several kids, in particular from the same family. And organizing, organizing all this, is a huge uh, challenge. It's small, it's not big. And so just, it was to give you an example of problems which are big, like this one, and problems which are small, but still complicated, like uh, computer vision in some, in, some, in some setups. Okay, so just to summarize this uh, introduction, so I have a lot of problems where both P and N are large. So always P will be the dimension of my inputs. And if you wish, we can take uh, computer vision as a running example, where P will be the number of pixels, and N the number of observations. And we have, I have shown like many examples. So what will be, um, what, what the task that I will try to address uh, today is running time. Okay? Whenever you want to run any algorithm on those type of data, when both P and N are large, you want to be careful about running time, and you want to avoid any uh, non-linear complexities. Okay, so if you want your algorithm to be at at most, linear in the size of your data. So if you make no assumptions, if you have n objects in dimension p, it takes O of pn just to read your data, and you want your algorithms to run in that uh, running time complexity. So of course, as soon as you say, I'm going to run fast, you have to introduce a trade-off in terms of predictive performance. If I do nothing, it's O of zero in terms of running time, but it's not very helpful. Okay, so there will always be a trade-off between like statistics like optimization, you want to go fast, and statistics, you want to predict correctly. Okay, so this is one of the, of the main theme. And maybe the other theme, which is a, a bit uh, amusing, it's we go back to very simple methods from the 50s, uh, Robis and Monroe. I think I have a slide on that one, and this is the last picture that I'm going to, uh, to show. Is, um, yeah, so this is uh, one of the leading computers in the 50s, okay, so uh, IBM 1620, I have no clue what this is, but, I've been told it's a good it was a, it was a good computer, very expensive, 100k, very slow, okay, and, uh, uh, and very very big as well in terms of, of size. 
Okay, so at that time, computers were not powerful enough, so uh, people had created like, efficient algorithms to run those computers. Now we are in, two, in 2010, so I don't have a Huawei phone, I have, okay, I have another uh, brand of cell phone, but this is much more powerful, and uh, this one, it's more beautiful as well, it's more, more powerful, a bit less expensive, and uh, so we have much, like the computing power has increased a lot, but what has increased even more is the size of the data. Okay, so data have, out, have, outgrown, have outgrown the computing power, uh, and now we, are, we need to use the same algorithms, which is essentially uh, Robbins Monroe, that we, look, that we look at the data only once, and this is a master equation, which I will go over uh, heavily in this talk. But to me, it's amusing that for different reasons, we come back to the same algorithms, and for 30 years, where computers were powerful enough to deal with the data that we have, we didn't need those algorithms. Okay, so that is like a cycle. Uh, and which is due to both technical progress and uh, increase of the amount of data. Okay, so this will be the outline of, um, of, uh, of my talk. I will just spend some review about what I mean by supervised uh, machine learning. And I will go over the main algorithm that people use, which is called a stochastic gradient. And, and the only technical part, concept that, will be, that I will introduce in the talk, is the concept of strong convexity. So it's like classical conditioning, of an optimization problem, and if you're well-conditioned, it goes fast, and if you're ill-conditioned, it goes slow, and those numbers will be uh, the convergence rate of the, of, of the algorithms. Okay, it will be the distance, it will be the, uh, your performance okay, of your algorithm uh, minus the optimal performance of your problem. Okay, this, has, this has to go to zero as n, the number of observations is going, is going up, and of course, you want this to go fast to zero, and the magic numbers will be 1 over n and 1 over root n as convergence rates, 1 over n being better than 1 over root n, and we see that uh, in the classical uh, analysis of those the algorithms, uh, you have lower bounds of complexity, so you have like running time, running time which you cannot uh, beat, okay? And we show that we can beat them uh, by, of course, adding some assumptions, and this will be like least squares uh, at first, and then we will use like smooth losses uh, uh, to beat like, the classical lower bounds of uh, optimization. Okay, so a bit of, uh, of notation. So I'm going to consider like uh, always n observations x i y i. So this can be uh, your images. Uh, x i can be your image. Y i can be the uh, uh, real number coding the presence or absence of an object in the image. We will assume we have n observations. They are all like independent and identically distributed. From a set of from sort of the same distribution, and we're going to assume that we do linear predictions. Okay, so this is a strong uh, strong assumption, but you have to be careful. It's not linear in the it's linear in the parameters of your problem and not linear in the uh, in the inputs. So in phi of x, you're going to put all your knowledge of the problem. Okay, so if you do computer vision, you're going to encode like shape, color, texture in that phi of x, and these of course are nonlinear functions of your inputs. If you do like bioinformatics, you're going to encode whatever you know about the biology and, the, and, and, uh, and chemistry, and so on. Okay, so this is where you put all the expert knowledge, and of course, once you know that phi of x, it becomes an abstract problem uh, where uh, you do linear predictions, and this is what I'm going to consider uh, today. I'm going to assume I, I, I'm going to assume I have p uh, such uh, features, p being, uh, being uh, quite large. So I'm going to consider very classical, like regular empirical risk minimization, where I'm going to minimize with respect to my uh, predictor theta, uh, an, ob an objective function, which is a sum of a data fitting term. Okay, so I go over my data, I take the average of uh, L, which is the loss. Okay, I'm going to pay a cost of predicting, uh, this is my prediction, and this is my output. So I have a loss function, which I will describe in the next slide, uh, for each data point. The goal is to minimize, is to minimize this, Okay, you can, can think about least squares being, as, being one example. And we will need to regularize for several reasons. One of them being, uh, one of them being that um, you, want to not, you want to predict well on future data. So what are the usual losses? So for that talk, you can say it's least squares. Okay, least squares is the most simple, is the most simple loss. This is adapted to cases where the output is a real number. Okay, so this will be the, one of the main motivations. But uh, in many instances, you want to predict a binary random variable. Let's, let's look at the most used uh, instance, which is like uh, advertising, click prediction. 
Okay, so if you want to predict if, if you're going to click or not on, a, on, an, on an ad, then the output is click, no click. Okay, so y will be zero or one, okay, or minus one or one. And clearly, if you use a square loss, you're going uh, to try to force, like, uh, to force, you're going to have bad predictions, and because the loss is not adapted. So what people have created in the last, like, 20 years are losses adapted to, uh, to uh, binary classification, where your output is minus one, one, okay? So this is your classical uh, output. Minus one will be, one will be a click on the ad, minus one, no click on the ad. And you're going to predict as a sign of your linear function. So of course, the linear function has an output, a real number, a due to threshold, and it takes the sign of that uh, real number. So essentially, if uh, you make an error, if the sign of your prediction is not the sign of your label. Okay? So if you take the product of y uh, times your prediction, if that product is positive, you make, uh, you make no errors, no cost. If that product is negative, you have a cost. Okay? So essentially, what you're going to be judged by is a function of your predictions, which is uh, only depend on the product y times your, your predi times your prediction, and that function is a zero-one loss, which is uh, the blue the blue loss uh, here. So this is uh, the metric when you're going to be uh, using that algorithm. The problem is that this metric is not convex, not even continuous, so it's, a, it's kind of uh, very hard to optimize. So what people have been doing in the last, I think this is like it was a hot topic in the 90s and 2000s was to design convex surrogates uh, to that zero-one loss. So those have names, and which, you, which, which you may be familiar with. The first one is in turquoise, this is a square loss. So this is very simple surrogate. But as you can see, it's going to over-penalize a lot uh, good predictions. And this is something as, as quite bad. And what has been like leading uh, uh, the pack in the last 20 years is the, the loss in red, which is a, called the hinge loss. And this leads to the support vector machine, which you may have heard of. And, uh, and this is a red, and the green is a so-called logistic loss, which is the one which is heavily used uh, in industry. And one of the reasons is that it is a smooth loss. Okay, so this will be a major uh, aspect of my talk, is that smoothness helps you uh, to optimize. So this is why in this talk I'm going to consider only the logistic loss in green and the square loss in turquoise. Okay, so now I will assume that I have one of those two losses. So let's go back to my original problem. Then you have two quantities of interest, which, is, uh, which are super important for machine learning. You have the training cost, okay, so, which I will call f hat. This is a cost which you can observe. Okay? Give me your data, give me uh, your predictor, like I can compute the loss on my training data. Okay? This I have access to and I want to minimize. But this I don't really care so much. What I really care about is the, predi the prediction on unseen data, which I call the, uh, the testing cost, which I will call f, which is the expectation from like pairs of inputs, outputs coming from the same distribution of the same loss. Okay, so this is uh, the testing cost. And I have access to the training cost, but I really care about the testing cost. So there are two uh, main questions that people tackle like in uh, statistics and machine learning. The first one is to compute theta hat. Give me the data, I want to compute this. So this is a pure uh, optimization uh, problem. And the second is a pure statistical problem. Give me theta hat, the optimal, uh, or something which is close to optimal for that thing. Does it, predict, does it do well on this f of theta? Okay, so this is the two uh, main aspects. You have the training cost, which you have access to, and the testing cost, which you really care about. So the key in the, in the research method is to tackle those uh, simultaneously, okay, in the sense that you want to Take an you, you don't want to separate this in two pieces, okay? People that do optimization and people that do statistics. We're going to merge the two together. So a bit, a bit of uh, like assumptions. So this is uh, very simple. I'm going to assume that my functions are, are smooth. And what I mean by smooth, I mean that the second order derivatives will be bounded from above, okay? So this is from, uh, for all my, all my Hessians, the eigenvalues are less than L. So very simple, on the left, a smooth function, on the right, a non-smooth function. So this is uh, uh, very simple uh, for that direction. And in the context of machine learning, if I, this is my traditional loss, if I assume that my loss L is differentiable and smooth, then essentially the Hessians are proportional to covariance matrices, and assuming boundedness of the Hessians is, la is one uh, sufficient condition is to have boundedness of the data. So this is, this is typically seen as a weak assumption, and I'm going to make it throughout the talk. 
The less weak assumption is when you invert that inequality, and this is uh, what people call strong, uh, strong, strong convexity. So a function will be strongly convex. So I'm, simpl I'm simplifying a bit. If all the eigenvalues of all the Hessians are bounded from below by a constant. So if that constant is zero, you get convexity, but you want that constant to be strictly greater than zero, zero, and you get a strong convexity. So on the left, you get a convex function, which is not strongly convex because you get a flat part. This is a, an affine part over there. On the right, you get a strongly convex function, which has curvature in every direction. So this is in 1D. In 2D, uh, this will be the traditional, uh, traditional image. Here are plot level sets of uh, uh, contour plots of a function in 2D. So this is a global minimum, and you go up in all directions. So this is like a function with a good condition number, so a large value of mu, and this is a function with a small value of mu. Okay, so this is really the main, uh, the main uh, images. So as you can guess, those ones will be easier to optimize than those ones. Okay, so this is uh, the main uh, message of, uh, of the talk. So why is it a big assumption for machine learning? It is because if I take the same, the same problem, where I have an average over my training data of a loss function, and if I assume square loss for simplicity, then the Hessians are all equal to the covariance matrix. So that covariance matrix is a matrix of size p, okay, p times p, obtained as a sum of n rank one matrices. So the rank of that matrix, the rank of that matrix is at most, at most n. So if I have like p bigger than n, which is common in applications, think about like computer vision, p might be millions, then you will never be invertible, so you will never be strongly convex. So in a sense, most modern problems are not strongly convex. You always have directions of, of very strong correlations. So what people have, have done uh, uh, to, um, to deal with this is to add, okay, if you're not strongly convex, let's add something to make it strongly convex. And this corresponds to adding like a square norm uh, like this. The problem with this is that it makes your problem better behaved, it will be easier to optimize, but you are not optimizing something different. You add a bias to your problem. So whenever you see like a regularizer like this, you should think at, as mu tending to zero as you get more data. Okay, so this is very important. Mu is not free. If you add mu, you make it better behave, but you don't solve the correct problem. So in that talk, I will not use mu whatsoever. I will do other, another type of regularization. Okay, so now let's review the classical algorithms to do like uh, optimization. So this is very basic. So if I assume like a convex and smooth function, gradient descent is the most classical algorithm. And so you go, it's an iterative algorithm where you start from any point and you, you go down the direction of the negative gradient with a small, uh, uh, with a scalar parameter. And the key is that that algorithm, it's known that it's going to convert to the global optimum of the function if you assume convexity. And the speed at which it's going to convert will depend on the easiness of the problem, which is characterized by the presence or absence of strong convexity. So if you take a really easy problem, strongly convex, then the gradient will uh, push you toward a good direction uh, very quickly. And this, what you can show is that you get an exponential convergence rate uh, uh, often, often called linear convergence rate. Every time you make an iteration, you divide the cost by a fixed amount. Okay, so those are easy problems. The problem is that for harder problems, you go from something which is exponential to something which is 1 over t, which is uh, much, much slower. Okay, so this because you tend to oscillate a lot, you make very, very small steps when you have a long valley uh, like this. So this is, this may be bad news. Okay, the even, even worse news is that this cannot really be beaten, in the sense that if your problem happens to be hard, it's hard. It's not because and the algorithm will be slow, not because of the algorithms, but because of your problem. Okay, so you have lower bounds saying that, okay, you can beat those, but the best you can do is one over t square, okay, for example, so which is faster than one over t, but this, you cannot, you cannot beat them. Okay, so if, if the problem is difficult, this is, a, there's not a lot, a lot we can do. But what it does for you, is adaptivity, in the sense that you don't need to tell uh, gradient descent if it's going to be uh, easy or not, okay? Just run the algorithm, and it's going to adapt automatically. So this is the key advantage of those algorithms, adaptivity. If you're not adaptive, you're going to uh, uh, be always very slow. So of course, people have noticed that uh, you want to avoid those oscillations, and people have considered a Newton method, okay? So a Newton method, you replace the scalar parameter there by uh, the inverse of the Hessian. Okay, so this will converge quadratically, so you get very quickly 
a lot of significant digits in your, in your solution, but you have to first uh, like be the Hessian, so this is a P by P matrix, so it's going to be hard when P is uh, 1 billion, and you have to invert the linear system, which is even harder. Okay, so this people don't consider with large amounts of data because every step is uh, too costly. And even, even uh, more important, so this is a very big difference between like, machine learning, statistics, and optimization, is the fact that we don't care about high precisions. Okay? So Newton will get you the answer up to machine precision very quickly, but very quickly, in a, in a small number of iterations. So every iteration is, 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 uh, is very slow, but you need only a small number of them. But we don't care. We being people from machine learning. Okay, if you go to other people that use optimization, they may care, and they're, I'm sure they're right. But in our, in our setup, our cost functions are averages. Okay, so this means that naturally they deviate from their expectation with a, with a deviation of 1 over root n. So our functions are already not well defined, so it's useless to, to go below that, uh, to go below that uh, error. So this is really a key that we can use bad optimization methods. Okay, which, may be, which may be very slow for others, but for us, it's enough. We want to get quickly to a decent place. This first, uh, first aspect. Second aspect, in machine learning, the cost functions are, are, are averages. Okay, so we don't optimize any cost function G. We have uh, averages. And with this, we can use to get faster algorithms. Okay, so this is the main topic of the talk, which is stochastic approximation. So what is uh, stochastic approximation? So this is a wide a wide field, but which I will see from a very small uh, uh, angle. I want to minimize the function f, okay, so this is the main theme in this talk. This is my, my cost, which I want to minimize, but I don't observe the gradient. If I was to observe the gradient, I would simply do gradient descent, I would be happy about it. I only observe noisy estimates of my gradients. So every, every time steps, I don't have access to the gradient, but just a noisy estimate. So the key is that that noisy estimate is unbiased in the sense that it has uh, the correct expectation. It may have any variance as long as it is bounded, uh, it's, it's, it's okay. But it has a zero bias. So in our case, this is very, uh, very natural. We're going to consider a noisy gradient obtained uh, by a single observation. So the key, this is really the most important slide of the, of the talk. What is F? In, my, in my, this setup, F will be something which you don't observe. This will be your testing cost. Okay? The expectation on, on, on unseen data will be what you really want to minimize. And you want a gradient of this, but you don't have access to it. So you're going to consider the loss from a single observation, Fn, which is the loss uh, from obs observation Yn, uh, phi of xn. Okay? So this is, give me one data point. If I compute the loss and its gradient, then if I take the expectation of this, then, if you invert the expectations and derivatives, you get the derivative or the gradient of your uh, test error. Okay, so this is the main, the only, the only thing that people that we do is, and we being like the community and not us, not just me, is uh, realizing, realizing that a single data point provides you a noisy gradient of the uh, gradient of the test loss. Okay, so this is uh, the most, the key, uh, the key, uh, the key thing. So of course, uh, this like, stochastic approximation goes far beyond uh, optimization, but in our setup, we can characterize the behavior, which is the goal uh, of today. Okay, so now let's look at the algorithm. Okay, so this is, uh, oops, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to uh, now have an iterative algorithm, and the key here is that I, is I have switched from the index t to the index n. Okay, so t was my index of our iterations for gradient descent, but now I'm going to use n being the number of observations. So why do I do this? It's because the number of iterations will be exactly equal to the number of observations. Okay, so t is going to be equal to n. So whenever I see a new data point, okay, I compute the gradient of my current predictor for that uh, data point, and I take a direction in the negative gradient. Okay, so this is often called stochastic gradient descent, and or uh, this is a form of Robbins, Robbins model. A key uh, novelty from the 90s, which seems like super trivial, but very important, is averaging. Okay, so this is, at the end, or when, I want, when I want to use my predictors, I take the average over all the past, and I will call that theta bar, and this is due to polyak rupert and I will show examples later. Now the key question is, what should the step size be? So for deterministic gradient descent, the step size is easy to find. You have line searches, and this is very, very basic. 
But for stochastic gradient descent, this is a, somewhat of an open problem, how, uh, how the uh, step size should decay. So if you don't decay, you can, you can easily see that you're going to make like round direction of the gradient plus some noise. So if you never decay, you're going to oscillate around the optimum. So it's not going to converge. So you need to have gamma n going to zero. And the key question is how fast, okay? And if you read a book on stochastic approximation from the 60s or 70s or even 80s, they will tell you take gamma n being one over n. Why? Because gamma n one over n, the sum is diverging and the sum of squares is converging. Okay, so this is the reason why. This is like uh, only for easy problems. Okay, so in my context, for only strongly convex problems. Then in the 80s, 90s, people have said you should have bigger step sizes, 1 over root n. Okay, so why 1 over root n? Because uh, the sum is diverging and the sum of square, no, yeah, the sum of square is also converging, but anyway, forget about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and so this is good for robustness. And what we propose with my colleague, Eric Boulin, is to go even, even further, go constant. Okay, so this is the main uh, topic for today. So let me mention my running time. So this is why in my introduction, this was the goal of, uh, the goal was to have algorithms that run in, in a complexity O of NP, N being the number of observations in P, the size of each of the observations. And this is by design the case, okay? So um, when it, since my number of iterations is my number of observations, I simply take a single path through the data and do it. So the funny aspect, and don't take this in the wrong way, it's a single line of code, okay? So what my colleague and I are focusing on are a single line of code, okay? So don't, uh, don't think that to do all the things that I've shown in the beginning, like uh, being Google, Amazon, and so on, there is a single line of code, okay? There are millions of lines of code just to prepare the data to run that single line of code. Okay, so all the heavy, uh, the heavy coding is done just to access the data, compute the features, and the, the learning part is really one line, which is essentially uh, that one. Okay, so I'm going and to focus on that single line, but remembering that you need many more uh, to make things work. Okay, first some bad news. Okay, so the bad news is that it has been like done by the Russians in the well, good news or bad news depending on your point of view. It has been done in the 80s by uh, the Russian. Essentially, the best you can do is a stochastic gradient descent, okay? And uh, the best meaning that you have like global, like minimax rights of convergence. This means that if you find something that goes faster on all functions, you're wrong, okay? So essentially, uh, and, the, and those rights are also linked with uh, uh, the absence or presence of strong convexity. So the quantity, the conditioning number is a key here. And the way you converge is 1 over n mu if you are strongly convex, so it's 1 over n, so it uh, goes like decently uh, fast. And this is achieved by uh, gradient descent with a certain step size. And if you're like, you have a big, uh, large, like, large number of features, so you, if you have long, a lot of correlations, if your problem is quite hard, then you go from 1 over root n. Okay, so this is uh, also achieved by stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so the good news is uh, then we can achieve the best uh, we can. The bad news is for modern problems, this is very slow, okay? Like one over root n, it goes to zero, okay? For sure, but this is uh, quite slow. The other, the second bad news is that you have to adapt the step size to the difficulty of the problem. So you have to decide in advance, am I going to be slow uh, or not? So uh, another line of work from the 90s, uh, also by Russians, uh, Polak and Yudisky, but Anatoly is in, in uh, Grenoble, is uh, if uh, you start to use like bigger step sizes and you consider smooth problems. So here, what I have hidden in, uh, on purpose is that those algorithms, they work for all, all problems, smooth and non-smooth, okay? And the, and the lower bounds are applicable for both non-smooth and smooth problems. But if you're willing to assume smoothness, okay, so as, we do modelization, we are free to choose a loss that we want. So if you choose a good loss, then we get smoothness. And what those people have shown is that you will get like this one over n convergence rate asymptotically. So if n is very large, then at the end, you, you're free, you go, you, remove, you go from one over root n to one over n, and you're free of the condition number. So remember, of the strongly convexity constant. So mu, remember, has to be small, okay? So sometimes, 1 over n mu is bigger than 1 over root n when mu is, uh, is too small. 
Okay, so why they've shown is that this can be done uh, for smooth problems. So the question is now, is it possible to merge everything and to get a single algorithm that will work on all, the, all those problems, as smooth problems, and with a convergence rate of 1 over n in all situations? Okay, the idea is you want to be robust to ill conditioning, okay, so you want to avoid that 1 over root n and get 1 over n in all situations. So this is what we're going to present, and I have like 20 minutes left. Yeah, okay, cool. So uh, let's take least squares. So least squares is by far the most uh, simple example. So this is my function for least squares, okay? And often, uh, stochastic gradient descent is referred to as least. Uh, least means square, LMS. This has been studied uh, a lot, but typically with a decaying step size. So here, what, what I mean by strong convexity, since in that context the Hessian is a covariance matrix, is simply that the Hessian has to be uh, like invertible and with the lowest eigenvalue value being bigger than mu. So this is a classical assumption. So what I've proposed uh, with my colleague, like Eric Moulin from Telecom, is to use, a, to use a constant step size, okay? Not one over n, not one over root n, just constant, okay? So this is like just uh, the result, and I will try to explain uh, the uh, intuition behind it. So you assume boundedness, so this we assume to know. You assume, or you assume, you sigma is a loss in your predictions, and what uh, we were able to show is that and just to give you an example of the flavor of, of the thing that we prove is that um, this. So what is this? So you have f, f is test error. The key is that f is test error. Whenever you see a result about convergence in optimization in machine learning, you should question, do I get a convergence on my test error, my train error? This is a test error, so this is what you really care about. Theta star is my optimal prediction in my class of functions, okay, the best I can do. Theta bar n is my, is my, uh, my average estimate, okay? It is random because my data is random. My data are random. So I take an expectation over the randomness of the data. Okay, so this has to be positive because theta star is my optimal, uh, the minimizer, minimizer of f. And this goes to zero with two terms which are classical, uh, which are classical in optimization in, machine, in uh, statistics. The first, the second one is, uh, uh, depend on the, uh, your starting point. Okay, if you start close, of course it's easier. Okay, so the bounds typically uh, have to reflect that uh, the closeness of the initial point. Okay, and depends depends on the, on the initial point divided by n. Okay, no, this is a key n and not root n. And then on the left, this is a classical term which is uh, the depending on the noise of your problem. Okay, so it's called sigma 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 square p over n. And for the experts in statistics in the room. This is the traditional like, uh, performance of least squares. Okay? This is one which you cannot beat. Even if you had infinite uh, computational power, you cannot beat uh, this sigma square p over n, and we achieve it by uh, simply a single path through the data. Okay? So here, the, value, the formula is not so important. The key is that you have 1 over n, and the mu has disappeared from the equation. But the funny part is that you could get that, that algorithm with no computation. Okay? So this is maybe like another important slide, is by just looking at the uh, Markov chain aspect of the problem. So you take this, my recursion, so this is my loss of a single data point, yn minus my prediction square. This is my uh, stochastic gradient recursion. So if I take the gradient of this with respect to theta, I get my residual times my, my feature. Okay, so this is uh, uh, very classical. Now my xn are id. Okay, so whenever you do a stochastic approximation with IID inputs, then your iterates form a Markov chain. This is always true, fine. But now my gamma, my step size is constant. So this means that my Markov chain is homogeneous. The dynamic is always, always the same. So now if you make a few extra assumptions, then that, that Markov chain should converge to a stationary distribution, okay, which I will call pi of gamma. Of course, this will depend on the value of my step size. So at the end, what you, the way you should think about this algorithm is that it, it never converges. So you start from theta zero, you follow your dynamic, and at the end you start to oscillate around like the expectation under your stationary distribution, theta bar of gamma, okay? You oscillate around it, but you never converge, okay? But the key now is when you do averaging, uh, okay, the first key, sorry, is that for these squares, you can easily show that you do oscillate around the true value. Okay, the reason is that the gradient is a linear function, so you, have, uh, you can invert like uh, gradient and expectations. So you oscillate around the true value, so this means that 
if you do averaging okay, of the trajectory, you're going to uh, converge to the expectation under the tachinery. And here, this is your global optimum. Even better, it is known that, this is like various um, ergodic theorems, that the rate at which you convert to the global optimum will be 1 over root n in distance. Okay? But since we measure errors in square distances, you get 1 over n from the start without any computation. So just because you have a homogeneous Markov chain and that which oscillates around the true value at the end, then you get, with averaging, the convergence rate of 1 over n. So this is a bit like misleading in the sense that you get 1 over n, but you may not get those constants, okay? So the heavy lifting in the paper is to get those constants and to show that they don't depend on the condition number, okay? But the 1 over n aspect is uh, straightforward from the, uh, straightforward from the, um, from the analysis. So let's look at a very basic, very big data, okay? P equals 20, okay? So I have a bigger one uh, on the next slide. So it's just to show uh, intuition behind the algorithm. So I'm going, I'm considering like a synthetic example uh, with P equals 20. And uh, in all my plots, I will always plot in the x, or x axis the number of iterations, which is equal to the number of observations in a logarithmic scale. And in the y axis, always the distance to optimum also in logarithmic scale. So if you converge, you should go down like this up to uh, minus infinity. So here I've tried like several step sizes, okay? Three constant step sizes and one decaying step size. And in dotted, this is before averaging. And in uh, plane, this is after averaging. So as you can see, if you don't, if you don't do averaging, because those like three colors, and you don't average, you do oscillate, okay? So this is my slide from before you're not uh, supposed to converge because you do converge towards your stationary distribution, so you will never converge, okay? What you can observe is that if you take a smaller step size, then you get a bit closer, okay? You get closer, but never, never there. Now, if you start to average, then those curves tend to uh, minus infinity, and if you look very carefully, the slope uh, tends to be minus one at the end. Okay, so this is just an illustration of the fact that by doing averaging, you transform your non-converging uh, problem to a converging problem. So my intuition is that by constant step size, okay, maybe I go here, if you do a decaying step size, you start there and you go very slowly to that region, okay? And it takes, takes a while. By going with, with a constant step size, you go very quickly there and then you oscillate and averaging allows you to converge. Okay, so this is what you see in the turquoise plot. So if you don't, if this is a decaying step size, then you do uh, you do you, you decay if uh, you decay uh, if you if you use a decaying step size without averaging you still converge but you get you get you get uh, slow uh, slow convergence and if you start to do averaging with decaying step size you you, you start slow, slowly and then you, you do uh, recover that but it takes uh, takes more time and this will be my last uh, technical slide. Just benchmarks, okay? So of course, you want to apply this to bigger uh, than uh, P equals 20. And even those benchmarks, which are classical, or which were classical like two years ago or three years ago, are big, but not super big, okay? So I've, I've taken like two classical benchmarks from the community. One where P is 500 and you have 500,000 uh, observations. And one U, which is more, more typical, where P is huge, okay? So you have uh, 1 million features, but the data are very sparse. Okay, so many of them are zero, and n is decently big. So top is the first data set, and uh, bottom this is the second data set. So what do I have left, left and right? Okay, this is one of the hidden, uh, not very glorious aspect of optimization, is that typically what uh, people do, and I'm also like, I do this often, so I'm allowed to uh, say bad things about myself, which is typically people do, if they show a bound like this, they say, oh, I take this step size and this is going to converge optimally in various aspects various, for various reasons. And then they show simulations, but often they use a different step size, okay, which is much bigger, because otherwise this is much too slow. Okay, so this is what I've done on the left. On the left, I've taken uh, C equals 1, which is like the, the, the step size which is given by, uh, by, uh, by um, in the, in the various analysis, okay? So forget about the, 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 the red line. 
So that you should focus on the uh, blue line, which is a constant step size, and uh, on the uh, no, blue, which is constant, and green, which is decaying. And as you can see, uh, if you don't optimize the step size for the decaying uh, step size, okay, it goes very slow. Okay, so this is this is logarithmic scale. Okay, so this means that before, uh, if you're here, you are the performance like. Um, tens of thousands of uh, data points uh, later. Okay? So this is very typical of optimization. If you use the step sizes from papers, it's very slow. Okay? For our constant step size, it's still uh, going, going down quite quickly. Now, if you start to optimize, things may differ a bit. Okay? So for the decaying step size, if you start to optimize, so I have optimized to be as small as possible uh, uh, for, the, for the dotted line. So to be correct there, I have to take C so large that I have to start to diverge. Okay, so this is a classical uh, behavior of decaying step sizes. The decay is too is too rapid, so you have to take a constant which is very large to be uh, working well at the end. So to work well at the end, you have to start you have to start doing bad at the beginning. Clearly not a good behavior. And if I optimize the constant C for a constant step size, doesn't change uh, doesn't change much. Okay, so this is just for one data set, as this you can see for several uh, other data sets uh, as well. Okay, so robustness is, is, is a key, is a key uh, issue here. So you want to be robust with respect to the conditioning, okay, but also robust with respect to the various constants that, we, that, that you need to use uh, for the algorithm. So of course, if you optimize the constant C, it's going, to work, it's going to work better because it's going to be a bit faster. But often this is first costly and then uh, sometimes dangerous because now you, you move away from the convergence proofs, so it may it may seem to work at the beginning, but divert at the end. Okay, so I think it's important to have both a convergence proof and a, a step size for which you have the analysis and which works decently in practice. Then this will be my last, really the last line is uh, what happens if you don't if you don't, if, you don't, if you don't have the square loss. Okay, so of course. In advertising, they don't use a square loss. They use, they use a logistic loss, which is not which is not a square loss. So let's see, let's see if we can reuse our uh, intuition. So we also have a Markov chain. Doesn't depend on the on the shape of the loss. It is also homogeneous, okay, because gamma will be constant. You will also have a stationary distribution, okay, you converge. But now uh, the way you define the uh, stationary distribution is the expected gradient is zero. The problem now, if f is not a square function, f prime is not a linear function anymore, and you cannot invert like expectations, expectations and gradient. So the gradient that you average under your stationary is not zero. Okay. So what you have is that you uh, do oscillate. Okay. And if you do averaging, you do converge quickly, but to the wrong, to the wrong, uh, wrong value. Okay. So this is your optimal value, and you converge to the wrong value. So what I won't describe are ways to Essentially, uh, restore convergence. Okay, so you, you have ways with ex uh, twice the complexity of uh, stochastic gradient descent to just like uh, avoid this and convert to the true optimum. So, in the interest of time, I won't, I won't, I won't do it. But this is based like on Newton. So, just to, uh, to conclude, so, um, so what I've presented is a constant step-sized average, average uh, stochastic gradient. So, the goal, and this is maybe the the main, like, uh, if, you are, if you have to remember a number, okay, you have 1 over n, 1 over root n. If you're slow, this is 1 over root n, but the goal is you want to be fast, okay, and this is what, what, what we were able uh, to achieve by using something and using smoothness of the, of the loss functions. If we have a non-smooth loss function, there's no way we can get better than 1 over root n, and we were able to do it by using smoothness. So this is simply like constant step size stochastic gradient for square loss. And uh, for uh, the non-square loss, like for like logistic, you need to use like uh, so what I call like online Newton step, which has the same complexity as a stochastic gradient descent, but which I didn't describe. A key is robustness to step size selection, of course. There are many many uh, extensions that people have been uh, been considering that setup, um, which I won't uh, I won't uh, really describe. Maybe the last two ones. So the first one is parallelization. Okay, so all of this is if I have a single computer and I do all my computing on, on, on a single node. So of course, when you have lots of data, the data are stored in several computers. Okay, so clearly, 
people are trying hard to make this uh, distributed. So if you want to distribute the slow algorithms from the 50s, it's already possible. Okay, people can, can do this, it's quite easy to distribute. But the problem is, you, when you go from one machine to two machines, you have to go from the fast algorithms like that one to a slow algorithm. So you lose a lot by going from one to two machines. Okay, so what you always want when you go distributed, if I go from one to two machines, I have to always improve. Okay, so the, the, a lot of people are trying to take fast algorithms like this one, so we're not the only one having such algorithms, but trying to make them distributed. And this is, this is tough uh, to, uh, to make sure that you always improve as you add, add more nodes. And finally, very also quite important, a lot, a lot of research right now, what about non-convexity? So here, here I have assumed convexity of my loss functions. So this includes least squares and logistic. But many people now are trying to uh, go non-convex. And one of the reasons is, uh, go back. To, one of the reasons is, is here, is that the features. Okay, so it's okay to assume convexity if you are given the features. Okay, so if you have an expert that will give you one of the good features, linear predictions are okay. But in many setups, you also want to learn the features as well. You want, like in computer vision, the ultimate goal is give me a bunch of images and let the machine uh, do its stuff, and then up you get the prediction. Okay? Now you have to learn features, and now this becomes a non-convex problem. Okay? So you may have heard about like, people doing deep learning, okay? uh, neural networks. The only difference with what I'm presenting is that they optimize both with respect to your par theta parameter, like we do, but also with respect to fear of x. So this is non-convex and really interesting because this is where uh, you can make a lot of improvements. If you, let, if you have a lot, if n is very large, you can really let the machine uh, do everything uh, from, from scratch. And, but now you need to learn fear of x, and this is non-convex and quite, quite open for the moment. Thank you for your attention. So, any questions? Thank you for the talk. Um, we are applying stochastic approximations um, to predict the channel state of wild users. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out to be quite a powerful approach, at least mm -hmm. in the lab. Um, one, I find I your approach of the fixed, of the constant mm -hmm. steps quite interesting because. Um, Let's say there are two properties where a wireless system differs from a uh, system like advertising. One is um, that we operate on the tight, on the strict real-time constraints. So real -time. real time constraints. So we basically need a solution every millisecond or every 10 millisecond on a small DSP, not mm -hmm. even on an inclusive view. And the second property is that we need robust solutions, mm -hmm. which means on the st statistics of the channel changes, um, we cannot be wrong, or we should not be wrong, because when we do wrong, the, the users or multiple users lose coverage. It's a bit different than advertising, where it doesn't really hurt. In fact, people are, are use constant step size for tracking. Yeah. Typically, because if, you're, if your data are, are uh, not ID, but they vary over time, uh, constant step size is a way to, uh, to be adaptive to the changes in your data. Okay, so clearly, so this is not what we have uh, considered. It's not, our, it's not our motivation, but typically this is used a lot for tracking constant step size. So you will, get, you, you will adapt to changes in your, in, your, uh, in, your, uh, in your data. But of course, you have to have, yeah, then you need to average over a smaller window. So you average over like, the last, whatever, any uh, k iterations instead of overaging from the start. But this is uh, used a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think actually, one, one more point. Mm -hmm. uh, both questions are robustness and, and real-time concerns, but some are related. Because um, if, you, if you, let's say, if the statistics of the channel change, that you need to readapt. Always good if you want to do that quicker, right? Because then you, you come back. Yeah, I think robustness. I think for um, I think my goal is take like uh, linear systems. Okay, I, I hope that you all trust uh, Laypack or when, when you, when you invert a matrix, you trust it. Okay, maybe not the experts, but I trust it. And the goal is to have the same kind of trust for those algorithms. Okay, and so this means to be extra robust. You have to cover all possible cases. Okay, so typically here. If I take a, a step size which is too big, okay, so let's, let's take examples, even for that toy, I, I, should, I should put it again. If I take like two over R square, okay, it's going to blow up, and not blow up like being bad, blow up like uh, 10 to the, like going to diverge uh, really, really uh, a lot, okay? So 
whenever you play around with gradient descent and big step sizes, you have to be careful. So this is why making sure that your data are bounded is, uh, and this can be, uh, can be like uh, put explicitly. Okay, if I have a large data point, I just like squish it. Okay, so clearly we want robustness. We don't achieve that robustness yet. It's not yet part of uh, LAPAC, <laughs> but uh, the goal is really, the, the goal is this, to be as robust as linear systems. Merci. Yeah. yeah, I have a question about uh, the, the, the five function. Yeah. Uh, so as you said, uh, we might think of estimating it, or if we don't have enough data, then it's like the art of uh, the, the data scientist mm -hmm. to choose it properly. Okay. And my question is, uh, um, are there problems where you need, uh, uh, where your function phi needs to be extremely protracted, uh, and and uh, which makes it very difficult to to choose to compute maybe, uh, and and does this constrain you because you know essentially you you, you have to, to choose the phi to express your problem as an optimization problem. So is this always the right uh, the right way to go, or are there classes of problem where this would not be the right formulation because the phi would be too complicated, for instance? Uh, um, so I think first, in, for most problems, you know a bit about them. Okay, so I don't believe in like totally blind machine learning because you, you have like so, something called the no free lunch theorem. So if you want to be optimal everywhere, you're going to be very bad, okay? And it, you, can, you can formalize this very, very precisely, okay? So there's no magic, uh, magic algorithm. This being said, you have a class of problems which are common in signal, like all like natural signals. Speech, and we will talk by Stefan Malat this afternoon. If you take all the natural signals like speech, uh, speech and audio, uh, speech and uh, audio and, uh, and uh, images. Then you have like common theme like uh, emerging, and Stefan is an expert uh, in this. So for those ones, you can use the expert knowledge to, to create like a good fee. For a random problem which you which you have never seen before, there is no universal solution. Uh, there is no there is no. If you have, if you have lots of data, you can start to learn from it. But if you have a small amount of data, this is uh, this is hard. Uh, my question is not so much about learning, but about the class of problem. I mean, say that you have a problem which is formulated on a graph, and then... Oh, okay, so, okay, so then... You have to choose your five. Okay, then, okay, then a good part. So then, there's something called, like, so here, I've assumed that phi of x is known and explicit. Okay, so this was, like, very, very, uh, very uh, popular in the, like, 10 years ago, which is, uh, you can have implicit phi of x. Okay, you can have infinitely many phi of x. Okay, so you may think this is kind of uh, useless to have infinitely many phi of x because p is going to be infinite. But you can use algorithms that will only depend on the dot products between those phi of x, like so-called kernel methods. And now you have for any for any class of problems, like problems on graphs, you have good kernels for graphs. Problems on uh, trees, you have good kernels on trees. So now you have for every like type of problem, you have like typically good features. So graph mining, for graph mining, you have a, a list that people, uh, people try based on degrees and, and so on. So this is very, very classical. But for every type of problem, you have a class of features which, are, which people have considered before. Yes. Uh, 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 can you dismiss the, the Newton, uh, kind of dismiss the Newton method because of complexity, mm -hmm. uh, uh, practical complexity issues, mm -hmm. but there are classes of approximate uh, Newton methods that are, uh, in some cases, much more uh, use, much more uh, easy to handle. Some some of our classical computations are done with modified Newton methods. So I, I agree with you. If, if you do like uh, PDEs, for example, then the structure of the problem is very precise. You can use it, you can leverage it to get approximate Newton methods. In our context, what, the only thing that you know, you have to do Newton on the covariance matrix, and this may have no structure. It's hard to leverage uh, the structure to get fast algorithms. Okay, this is a big difference between like, like numerical analysis, where you know a lot about your problem, and you can design good approximation schemes, and you things where... To, you have to consider generality by, by gen this idea. Exactly, because you don't, you don't uh, know your features in advance, and you want to be robust to all possible features. This is a key, a key difference. But clearly, so what, clearly, any of the classical like preconditioning from numerical analysis can be used. It always helps a bit. But you want to be generic and robust is a key, the key issue here. Other questions? Yeah, one there. 
One of the major problems that we have in the wireless regime, as Stefan mentioned, is that we have to do calculations on the fly. Yeah. And most of the time, we don't have the luxury of observing uh, the, the perfect actual value of the gradient. Is there an interplay between the step size and the imperfect observations of the gradient that can be put in place to, to have a better uh, convergence rate or uh, convergence to the actual uh, optimal for this? Sure. Okay, so here there's a, it's a good question because it's a bit, if you take gradient descent, uh, why is it? Over there, okay, so here, so when you, when you do stochastic gradient descent, you have errors in your gradients, okay? So the key is that the errors are unbiased, so the expectation is, is exactly the gradient, but the variance can be anything. So it's, it's a bit amazing that you always make errors, but you end up still converging, okay? So this is unfortunately not the case in life, okay? You make, you make random errors, typically you don't, anyway. Okay, so, you, sorry. You make, er you, make, uh, yeah, you make random errors. Uh, randomness and unbiasedness allows you to converge to global optimum. Now, if your errors are not unbiased, okay, so they, if, they may be, if they may be adversarial, then if the error does not go to zero as you get more, more observations, I can take you anywhere. Okay? So if the errors are not random, you have to have a decaying magnitude of those errors. Otherwise, you can, can, can be really bad. So of course you can bound, so we have other words where we bound, if you give me an error in each gradient, I can bound the, uh, the distance to optimum at the end, but at the end you need the errors to go down as you get more iterations. So if you get like quantization, I guess maybe quantization uh, errors are not random, so they are close to random I guess, but they're not totally random, so you have to control for this a bit if you want to make sure you converge. Okay, so what has the problem that Sometimes all those bounds are very conservative, okay? So do you want like to be robust and probably correct? Or do you want to gain maybe like a, another magnitude of speed by allowing yourself sometimes to diverge? So there's a trade-off here which is not totally clear. Okay, more questions? Then uh, we have 20 minutes break and then we have the next talk of Cédric Villain.